personal talk given to the Tara Loka community on a community night in the Tara Loka community shrine room. Uh, Songs of the Sisters, Kisigotomy. So most of you will, will have already heard of Kisigotomy and the story of Kisigotomy and the mustard seed. That's not what I'm going to be talking about tonight, but I'll just give you the backstory. Kisigotomy was a very um, humble young woman who came from quite a poor background, married slightly above herself, and therefore her in-laws took advantage of that quite extensively and bullied her and treated her really badly until she produced a son. Once she produced a son, she had status, she was well loved in the family, everything was going really well and then he lasted for two years and unfortunately then died and then you've heard the story from there. And that's, that backstory is really key in what happens to Kisigotomi in her moments of enlightenment. So actually, when the Buddha gives her the teaching of the mustard seed, go to, go to all these houses and find someone that hasn't had somebody that's died in their household. And she goes and she cannot find someone. She immediately goes for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha in that moment. But what I didn't realise was, until, until I read this song, um, was that she wasn't immediately enlightened. So she went, for, she, went, she went for it, she was just like, I need to go for refuge at this point of deep, deep distress in her life. She'd lost all her status, she'd lost her place in the family, she'd lost her son, you know, it was, she felt like it was going to go all fall, fall into a complete pit. So she went for refuge, but she didn't become enlightened immediately. So this is her song at the moment of enlightenment, or around that time. Thus have I heard. Once when at Sarvati, the Lord stayed at Anata Pindaka's Jetta Grove. The nun Kisigotomi, having dressed, went one morning into town with her robe and bowl to beg for food. After her arms round and after she had returned with her arms food, she ate, then went into the dark forest to spend the day there. Arriving in the dark forest, she sat down at the foot of a tree. Then Mara, the evil one, wanting to inspire fear and terror and to ruin her meditation, went to that same place. Having gone there, he spoke this verse to her. What's going on? You look as if your child has died. You sit alone, tears streak your face. You've come to the woods alone. Are you looking for a man? But Kisigotomi thought, is this a human being or not? It must be Mara. He has spoken this verse because he wants to terrify me and ruin my meditation. When she knew this for certain, that this was none other than the evil one Mara, she addressed him as follows. I have finished with the death of my child and men belong to that past. I don't grieve, I don't cry. I'm not afraid of you, friend. Everywhere the love of pleasure is destroyed, the great dark is torn apart, and death, you too, are destroyed. Then Mara, the evil one, sad and dejected at realising, kiss a go to me, the nun knows me, vanished right there. So in the context of this talk, I'm talking about um, Mara, and I'm talking, when I'm, when I'm referring to Mara, how I see Mara in these kind of texts is it's either an internal voice or an external voice. So it could be my internal voice or somebody else's voice that I've taken in or an external voice, an actual person that may speak to me. And they want us, these voices, want us to stay limited, safe and um, keeping our existential fragility kind of... Um, hidden in some way, comfortable, and stay in the delusion bubble. So that's how I'm seeing Mara, as a voice that's wanting to keep me limited. And there's a number of levels, for me, there's a number of levels in this, uh, in this particular text that really resonate with me. So we've got the first level of Mara, because to go to me, is, and I'm going for the cultural sort of societal myth that uh, 
man will save me. <laughs> a man will save me. Also known as the romantic myth. So this really touches me. And uh, when, so when I read that, are you looking for a man? Sometimes I don't actually get Mara saying, are you looking for a man? But oh, maybe if I found the right man and we got married, I'd be happy and I could do this and I could do that and everything would be okay and I wouldn't have to do the spiritual life anymore. I do sometimes have that voice. Then we've got the second level of Mara, which I've sort of seen as, in this story, the voices of the ancestors. So for me, that's the family myth. And you can feel that coming really strongly through family. And of course, that was because families needed to stick together to look after each other to survive. So it's a very, very strong old myth of the family. Family takes care of itself. It's where the love is. It's where the love should be. Um, and the loss uh, particularly resonated when I read that first Kisagotomi story for the first time. That loss of her status when she lost her child you know, really resonated with my own sort of situation in my own family and me choosing not to have a child and how much I had to um, work with that loss of something. It wasn't status for me, but maybe praise, maybe kind of like just being normal. Anything, having a child might have made me normal. <laughs> no, it can never happen. And then the third point that I really love in this story um, is that she has to, Kisigotomi has to name Mara before anything else can happen. So it's the, she, he's the named one, the one who speaks, manifests, and she has to recognise him, say his name, and befriend him. It's like a three-stage thing. Recognise, I see you, you're Mara, you're my friend, I'm not scared of you. It's kind of like his power gets lost in that. Because it would be so much easier for us, it would be so much easier for me, if Mara was a really powerful, evil, dark lord, or the evil queen, or Maleficent, or somebody like that, where, you know, swans in in this beautiful gown, black and blue, telling me what to do and being really evil. That would be really easy to spot, but that Mara's not often like that. Mara is um, much more subtle, and has to get much, much more subtle the more we go on. So often our traumatised, unhappy, unseen, unloved bits of ourselves, the bits we can't bear to look at, they become more and more subtly integrated into the sense of who we actually are. So much so that we don't even realise they're even there until we realise we've been limiting ourselves with this internal voice or with the voice coming from outside. These traumatised bits are also caught up in the sense of our own memories of those events, the people, what people have said, all of that kind of thing. And then we have a whole load of preferences in how we want to live our lives and how we want to be in relation to that, that have come from these old, old stories. So I love the fact in this story that Kisigotomi just turns, to, turns toward this fish. She's in the dark forest, she's in the deep dark forest, Mara appears and she just turns towards him in fearlessness and, and calls him her friend. So, how do we recognise and befriend our own Maras? So first of all, we have to find the voices. So I've had to, I spent quite a while trying to work out what my voices were. And I've got a few examples of the kinds of things that have happened over the years, the kind of Maras I've had. So sometimes my voice is, is just a younger version of me. I had a very strong experience on a retreat here at Taraloka, maybe 2008, quite a long time ago, where suddenly I was furiously angry. I was furiously angry. Something about the washing up. <laughs> Something about the washing up in the retreat centre. Somebody had, had either told me to do it a different way or I thought they were doing it the wrong way. I can't remember. The details don't matter. But I was furious. And so I decided to take myself for a stompy walk up and down the track for a while. And I realised my uh, sullen, angry teenager was really vibrantly with me. So I walked down the track and had a good stomp and listened and, and ranted and let her say her piece. And then for some reason, I just felt like this real, really strong urge to thank her for her care and support that she gave me at that time in my life, where things were quite difficult at home, 
things are always difficult when you're a teenager anyway and then you've got I don't know divorces happening you've got your A levels and your GCSEs and you've got whole friendship things happening and it's all very confusing she she became quite feisty in that moment I became quite feisty but I've sort of retained that voice of anger when things weren't going the way I wanted to I've also had, um, on my ordination retreat, I had this really, I found the voice of me as a very, very uncommunicative uh, toddler. <laughs> Somebody, a part of me that couldn't verbalise, and so was often feeling frustrated, so not so much the anger, but um, sort of a sense of frustration. And at Akashivana on my ordination retreat, I spent, it felt like, eons but it might have just been a couple of days <laughs> allowing her to just come, as I was meditating just come and sit in my lap and be held and she, you know really really soothed soothed that sense of me so finding these voices these younger voices of ours gets harder and harder the closer they get to now so you might have a voice that's limited I have voices that are limiting me that are only a few years old that I've created so it's like I find if we really truly believe that we can forever change and there's this limitless potential, the maras that are stopping me are often just behind me going, oh, you can't do that. You're rubbish at meditation. You don't like study. Da 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 da. Uh, what else might they say? Anyway, they're a bit more subtle and they sound just like me now. They've got the same tone of voice internally. They've got like, you know, you know, it might be true. It might have only been last week, but still there might be a limiting voice there from my younger self. So the second Mara that I reflected on over the years is the friends and family. So this, this is kind of interesting. We've been looking in the community at um, the Brahma Viharas a little bit, and it's kind of like a near enemy. It's so close to, like, your friends and family are people that really care about you and want you to grow, in theory. <laughs> and sometimes there's a little bubble that, that you kind of think, oh, you, oh that's, that's there. Unhelpful views, opinions are reinforced by the people that we love. So how I noticed this was, if we go back to, the, to Kisigotami's original th uh, thing here, like you need a man, this is quite a strong storyline in my family and with friends as well. You need, you need a partner, you need a lover, you need a husband, you need a man to take care of you. And if you're not achieving that, if you haven't got the right partner, the right lover, the right husband, or any of those, then you must be unhappy. Now I had a, a uh, my favourite aunt, absolutely gorgeous woman, and my favourite uncle, they met each other when they were, when she was 18, he was 19, you know, really, really young, and then they were together for however long, 80 years or something. And... Um, I went to visit her a few years, a couple of years before she died, um, when they were both still alive, and I took my ex-partner with me for the first time. I'd been going out with him for a long time, never taking him to see my family, took him with me that second to last time I saw her. They were really chuffed that they'd met him, and then the last time I saw her, um, she was still talking about how wonderful it was that I had this partner, and I was trying to say, Actually, I'm not sure that, you know, the relationship's not going so well. You know, I'm not sure it's going to last. Oh, well, you know, it's better to be in a difficult relationship than have none at all. That was the kind of vibe I was getting back. It was better to just, you know, it's better to have a companion. What will you do when you're my age if you haven't got? What will, you be, what will it be like when you're 90 if you haven't got? If you haven't had what I've had with my husband? So, and I just realised in that moment... Oh, that is subtly a voice that I hear, I've heard regularly throughout my life from, from family and friends and the culture that I live in. Um, so the slightly easier version of Mara to, to meet is the people we find difficult, of course. So noticing our own reactivity in relation to people that, that we find difficult. And it's often said, you know, obviously we kind of think, oh, the people we find difficult, they're our best teachers and they use things we don't like about ourselves. But actually, it really might be the things we're finding really don't want to look at in ourselves is manifesting externally, right in front of our faces. And that can be quite difficult. 
And this can be subtle. It's not necessarily that there's an angry person, you're faced with an angry person, and you're like, oh, I don't like them because they're an angry person. And then you realise, oh, I don't like myself because I'm an angry person. I've got some anger in me or something like that. It might not be as obvious as that. So I'll give you an example. This is really embarrassing doing this to the community, but anyway. <laughs> no, you all know this already. So the community meditation slot. First thing in the morning, seven o'clock, we all get up and meditate with each other. And for years, I thought I was just, go I was just going to that meditation because it was a daily commitment. I was putting my energy in. I was understanding rationally the importance of collective practice. It's a support for the community. It's good for me because when I next go on retreat, I can see the benefit of it. And occasionally I'd sort of voice, uh, you know, morning, med morning sit isn't the best time for me. Um, but, you know, I'm going to just carry on doing it because that's what we're doing. This is what we're doing. We're supporting each other. I can feel the faith. I can, feel, I can see the effect on others. It's all really good. And then I think, oh, I've got Amara going on as well. A voice in my head saying, it's just a preference. You just don't like meditating in the morning. You'd rather do it another time. You know, just get over yourself. Or even just, I see you, Mara. So I think it's all dealt with. Then some, then some new people arrive in the community. And then uh, they, give, they come to the morning meditation. They give it a few days, or they might give it a few weeks, or even a few months. And then they say, ah, oh, this morning meditation isn't working for me. I'm not going to come for th two, three days a week because I need to do... X, Y, Z. I'd rather be doing prostration practice, I'd rather be doing this, I'd rather be doing that, I'd rather be going for a walk, whatever it is. And I have a massive reaction at that point. <laughs> so, so then I suddenly have to realise that I've been going to morning meditation full of resentment, resentment anger, ambivalence, um, that I don't want to listen to. It's not okay for me to have ambivalence, anger, resentment, or not want to do something that we're doing as a, com uh, as a community. So the Mara that I've, as I've been thinking about this talk, because you all know that story, you all witnessed that happen. Um, so as I was thinking about the talk, I was thinking, what, who, what does that Mara look like? What, and it's a he, just so you know. Doesn't, Mara doesn't always, isn't always a he in me. There's some, some women. But this is a lonely, slightly grumbly old man who's sitting in his chair, looking out the window, slightly grumbling at everyone going past, you know, kind of not, you know, it's not like a big rant, but it's kind of, oh, look, look at them wearing that, and oh, she goes up and down the road four times a day, and don't know where she's going, you know, just slight grumbling. So you can sort of ignore them, you can go, kind of go and visit, it's a bit uncomfortable, but it's not totally unpleasant, and you can kind of go and visit them, and then, but you just vaguely ignore what they're saying. And then somebody else goes and visits them with you and says something and, and agrees with them and they just light up. It's like ignition. Yes, I've been telling you that for months. Of course it's like that. I don't want to do that either. <laughs> they're out of their chair, they're animated, they're shouting. No one ever listens to me. <laughs> that kind of thing. So watch out for that, Mara, too. Okay. So, so I think this kind of... Um, this kind of song from the Terries allows us to start questioning, allows me to start questioning, well, where am I seeing Mara? What do I believe? What's been sent by society and culture into my conditioning? What's from my families? What, what is just the voices I've picked up generally through the, through the years? And do I want to keep listening to those voices? Yes, if they're letting you grow and move forward, by all, by all means. If I feel like my voice of, I need a husband, is helping me grow, great. <laughs> Mostly it's not this time. So they're holding me back. So it might be the voices of my parents. It might be my grandparents, my aunts and uncles. It could be teachers. It could be ourselves as younger self-caregivers. Can So can, my question to me is, can I even trust my own internal voice? Is it just an old one? Is it even just a few months old or a few years old? Has it got old views of myself and the world and the situation? Or is my internal voice in line with my current values? And then I came up with another question for myself. Like, How can I build confidence in myself in making positive choices 
from that internal voice that's going to benefit everybody. It's kind of like, oh yeah, can I be confident in that? So who do we trust to listen to if we can't trust our own internal voice? Do we trust the Buddha's voice? Do we trust the Dharma? Do we trust the Sangha? And do we trust the Sangha with the small s? That's, that's those of us that we're here together with. So I find, can we trust them more than ourselves? Interesting questions to sort of think about. And then the other thing is kind of like in this particular story, Kisigo to me is being told she needs a man, a child, uh, a family, a family unit to be safe. And she's renounced that, become a nun, but it's still sort of subtly taking its time to sort of work through. So the other question I've been reflecting on is what things, what people, what kind of lifestyle do I believe is going to make me happy, give me status, get me praised, give me fame, and, you know, if they're in our lives. So lots to think about. Thank you.